Welcome back. Today we're going to talk about the latest release in Craft Recordings Small Batch series, and that is Thelonious Monk's Brilliant Corners. Um, so before we dive in, as usual, um, if you like this type of content and you want to see more of it, uh, hit subscribe, hit the notification bell, and follow me over on Instagram at what underscore can underscore brown. All right, so what is this album? Brilliant Corners. Well, it's Monk's third for Riverside, and I'd say it's kind of the entry point, at least in terms of the Riverside catalog, to Monk's own compositions. So the thing is, the owner of the label, or really the co-owner at that point, was Oren Keepnews, and he had featured Monk already on two albums for Riverside both with him doing covers. So the first one um, was, let's see, it was U the unique Thelonious Monk, and the second one was Monk Plays Duke Ellington. And the purpose for featuring Monk for his first two albums on albums where he's not playing his own music is because they wanted to um, sort of grease the wheels for audiences to get a little bit more comfortable with Monk before they just unleash sort of his true um, sort of artistry on on everyone. And so th that's that's why they kind of featured him, you know, on uh, the unique Thelonious Monk, it was standards, and on uh, plays, uh, plays Duke Ellington, well, obviously it was Duke Ellington tunes, and so that's what they did. Um, this album, on the other hand, is, uh, is Monk's own original compositions, and it is quite a bit different in feel than those other two albums as well. This was also the album that, um, the first for Riverside, where they added horns uh, to, uh, to support him as opposed to him just doing, say, a trio format. So if I was to characterize this album, um, Brilliant Corners, I'd, I'd call this music much more challenging than his prior work for Riverside. And I mean that at least in terms of, in terms of the audience experience. Um, so this album does incorporate atonality and if not polyrhythms, at least constantly changing rhythms, even within the same tune. So the most notable example of that is the title track where the uh, the tempo just changes so uh, drastically and repeatedly throughout the entire piece that uh, that famously this was uh, this was one of those tracks that was just impossible for the musicians to record. I think in any review or any comments of this album, what, one of the things you're going to hear is the infamous 25 takes or whatever it was that it took to get Brilliant Corners right, and actually they still didn't get it right. Uh, Orin Keep News ended up having to splice together this track from, I don't know, like three or four takes, um, just because they couldn't, the band could not get through it all in one uh, in one take. So, so yeah, eight tonality, um, many different tempo changes. It is definitely less background music and more focused listening, at least in in my opinion. Um, but it, at the same time, it's incredibly rewarding listening. Uh, listening. A lot of people when they talk about this album talk about it as sort of an artistic statement. And I think that's the case. Um, it doesn't mean that you can't just sit back and not think about it and, and listen to it and absorb it. In fact, that's always the best way, right, to, uh, to, to, to process music. Um, but there's just a lot more to absorb here <laughs> than, than something, uh, than, than say music that's, uh, that's more repetitive, that's more expected. You kind of know where things are going because of uh, sort of obvious chord progressions and things. Um, you, don't, you don't exactly have some of those cues that, uh, that help you sort of orient yourself in the music. And I think that that's what makes this a little bit more of a challenging listen. And actually, I think this is the most challenging album that Kraft has released in their small batch series by far, um, which I think I suppose makes this an unusual choice, um, or maybe not. So if I'm thinking about the other ways to hear this album, um, obviously uh, this this is a very this is a very well loved album. So even in the 50s, there were multiple pressings. There were pressings all the way through, you know, the 90s and the 2000s and the 2010s and the original jazz classic series. Um, I would say that now we're in 2023, the last pressing of quality was by the Electric Recording Company, which um, if you're not familiar with the Electric Recording Company, I believe they're based out of the UK, and they have this sort of proprietary process that um, I suppose allows them to justify charging $600 for, a, uh, for a, uh, one of their records. Um, I have not listened to that edition, so I can't comment on how it sounds. 
Um, but uh, but yeah, that one, that uh, release was in 2020. There was an Analog Productions 45 RPM release of this album as well in 2003. Um, but even that record these days is going to set you back between two and three hundred dollars. So. Um, if what you're interested in is the sort of best possible version that you can hear of this album for something that is less expensive than that, um, perhaps the small batch is the answer. And I say perhaps because we haven't gotten into my comments yet. All right, so briefly, what does this album look like? Well, um, I showed it a few minutes ago, but, um, but as with each of the small batch series, uh, this is this is the sort of box that it comes in. Now this is a very narrow box as you can tell. So this is basically perfectly designed to protect a single record. There's not much other room in here. So nothing is gonna slide around. This thing is very sturdy. And actually I really enjoy sort of this box. And I'm not really, I'm one of those people who's not the biggest fan of box sets unless they're done really, really well. And I think unfortunately there's so many different box sets that are not done well, that are not of quality. This is an example of a box Box set that is done with quality. This is a very sort of, there's a texture to this. Again, like I said, it's very sturdy. These are all numbered. Uh, mine is number uh, 416, if that's, uh, if that's possibly visible. Um, and yeah, and, and obviously you can see a reproduction of the, uh, the cover, uh, which gives you sort of that visual cue of what's going to be inside. Um, so otherwise, what's inside is a, a short booklet that talks just a little bit about um, a little bit about the pressing and they show you pictures of the master tapes which kind of gives you that that warm and fuzzy feel that yes it was indeed um, sourced from the original master tapes um, and then of course you have the actual album I'll try to show this at an angle to minimize glare because i haven't taken it out of the shrimp shrink wrap yet i will though i don't know why i haven't i just haven't um, so anyway, yeah, this is what the album looks like. And similar to other Kraft Recordings um, releases, it is, of, uh, it is of great quality. Obviously, one of the things that Kraft does is they replace the original catalog number up here in the corner, as well as on the back with their own catalog number. That's just something that, uh, that we have to get used to because they are uh, not giving that one up. Um, so one of the other things that I'm gonna, uh, that I'm gonna show you actually is Oddly enough, not my original pressing, because I used to have an original pressing, but guess what? It was in terrible shape, and I, had, I ended up coming upon a really fantastic early pressing of Brilliant Corners, and that is what this is right here. So this is the small blue deep groove label, which probably doesn't even make it a second, maybe a third pressing, probably from like 1959 or so, early enough, right? But um, anyway, what you can see with this is that um, obviously the uh, the differences here, um, you have the original uh, you have the original catalog number, um, and on the back, is there really anything much to speak of? I mean, you can kind of see, you know, obviously Riverside and the different uh, the different catalog number. But otherwise, this thing is uh, basically the same. So a couple of other differences, actually, that I think is uh, is pretty interesting. So the first that you'll notice here is that um, with the Kraft Small Batch and with my, again, early reissue, um, it, maybe it's subtle, but maybe it's not. There's a difference in the size of the uh, of the title. Well, guess what? Kraft actually did a, a, a great job of replicating what that original pressing title would have looked like. So on the on the reissue, even the earliest reissue that this is, or you know, second reissue or whatever it is, they actually increased the size just for those covers, whereas the original one did have the uh, did have the smaller um, the smaller text. So that is actually correct. Um, the other thing that you're going to notice is actually a very significant difference in coloring, um, sort of tone or uh, sort of the warmth of uh, uh, between these two album covers. Now, again, oddly enough, um, you may look at this one and think, oh, Thelonious Monk didn't wear a pink shirt and why is his face as red, red as it is? Whereas you look on this one and, um, and you don't have that. And this one seems a little bit more natural. Well, um, those early covers also did have actually a lot of variation. I don't even think it was uh, sort of static across even the same pressing. There were lots of covers that were either kind of that warmer hued thing, and then there's lots of covers that were a little bit cooler in, uh, in tone. And so it's, it's, not, um, it's not a problem is what I'm getting at. Like, yes, it looks different, but it's fine. This is, this is still a, a great reproduction of the cover. And actually this one is probably even just better than my um, early repressing just because there's a lot more difference um, in, um, I, I, there's a lot more detail in, uh, in, in sort of the picture, and I think they did a great job sort of replicating it.
All right, so I'm gonna try to do the best I can to sort of explain, um, I guess, what I hear in the music, as well as a little bit of the differences, say, between between Kraft's reissue and, again, this, this sort of early reissue that I have, because there are differences, and I think it's important to kind of note um, you know what the, what those differences are for anybody who's who's speculating. Is it is it worth dropping the what is it a hundred and I think it's a hundred and nine dollars for this release. So it's not inexpensive. I think with tax and shipping, it's probably closer to one hundred and twenty, hundred and thirty dollars, right? So it's not the most expensive uh, edition, but I was very excited to uh, to get a copy and to uh, to check it out. Um, so I will say uh, also when I say I'm going to try to explain. This is um, this is complicated stuff, right? And uh, and I am, you know, I mean, Monk, Monk was a was a genius, and um, and he was incorporating a lot of ideas into this music that sometimes for me is hard to explain um, or even understand myself, right? Because because I'm no I'm I'm not not the musician that uh, that uh, that Monk uh, Monk was. Um, so interestingly. And I haven't mentioned this before, but I've got all these like compilations of uh, of downbeat reviews from the '50s. I think it starts in like '56 and it goes to like '63, something like that. They're each in these uh, in these books. Um, you can try to find these on um, on eBay, but they're quite collectible at this point as well. But anyway, the interesting thing that I saw in here was that uh, Brilliant Corners is listed right alongside uh, Monk's music as well as Thelonious himself. Uh, which are also, you know, both Riverside uh, records. So they all came out, or at least, sorry, were reviewed the same year, and each of them got five stars. And I thought that that, which is the highest star rating, um, I thought that that was pretty interesting because even though this is sort of, um, you know, more challenging music and a little bit more out there, and even Riverside was a little bit nervous uh, about putting this out, which is why they started with uh, Thelonious Monk in trio format, um, the the reviews were just glowing about this album. Uh, people really really liked it, and um, and I find that very interesting, especially within the context of 1957, the type of music that was being put out. Um, I you know I think that Monk was regarded as a very talented musician, but I think uh, and and people had heard his work for Prestige already, uh, probably bl uh, some Blue Note as well. So I think they knew where he was headed, but um, I personally think that Brilliant Corners is the sort of to date, uh, you know, as of 1957, the best executed music of his that he had recorded and also the most, you know, all sort of carefully say out there uh, music. So I think it's very interesting that it was received as well as it was. Um, so in, in, terms of, uh, in terms of this music, when I think about the reissue and the idea of like, what am I looking for in terms of improvements? There actually is quite a bit. And the reason why I say that is because the original pressing sounds very vintage. So as much as it's, you know, again, the sort of the best executed version of his work, and it probably sounds more, definitely sounds more modern than the music he was recording for Prestige and Blue Note in terms of the sort of how it sounds, the engineering, um, there it, it's still a dated recording in sound. It doesn't sound natural in that, um, again, I'm talking about my reissue, but I'm sure it's the same metalwork, right, as the, uh, as the original pressing, and so that's how the original pressing would sound. So when it comes to possible improvements with this album, what I was looking for is better balance with the piano and the drums and the bass in the mix. Um, you know that you're gonna hear the horns anyway. The horns are, are gonna be able to break through and they're gonna be able to sound. Um, I will say that there's some harshness in tone to both uh, Clark Terry's uh, work here as well as Ernie Henry's work. So, you know, is it possible they could have uh, cleaned that up perhaps? Um, another thing that I was looking for is whether Monk's singing was gonna be more or less audible. Um, so you can kind of hear him in that early pressing where he's singing and I was curious if that was gonna be a little bit more present in this mix. Um, and then, then there's the two sort of elephants in the room with this album, and that is the presence of unusual instruments. One is the Celesta, which is played by Monk, and the other is the Timpani, which is played by Max Roach. So um, the Celesta is on, let's see, the track uh, Panonica. And it is a very um, unusual sounding instrument in the context of jazz music and alongside uh, these other musicians who are all playing their parts. Um, and, uh, and, and Monk is playing presumably right hand on the uh, Celesta and left hand on the piano. And it's, um, it's very interesting. 
Um, then the other is Bemsha Swing, which closes the entire album, and that is where Max Roach is playing the timpani, and gosh, is it weird on the early pressing. So those are some of the things that I was looking for in terms of how are they gonna sound, is it gonna sound the same, is it gonna sound different? And I'm gonna try to kind of orient some of my commentary around those exact points. All right, so real quickly, the lineup. Um, so there are two lineups here, and I alluded to this, um, this difficult to record track, right? The title track earlier, and that's actually the reason for uh, the lineup change. So much of this album, it, let's see, it includes Ernie Henry and Sonny Rollins on sax, uh, Max Roach on drums, Oscar Pettiford on bass, and then obviously Monk. Um, the very last track, and only that last track, it, there's a, uh, the lineup actually replaces Ernie Henry, who was not available. He had joined Dizzy, uh, Dizzy Gillespie's uh, band, and so he was not available. He was replaced by Clark Terry, so they replaced an alto sax with a trumpet. Uh, I think trumpet, he doesn't play cornet here, I don't think, I think it's trumpet. And then um, Oscar Pettiford, who really had the biggest beef with Monk during the recording of the uh, sort of the primary sessions for this album, he just refused to come back. And so Monk got Paul Chambers to come in and, uh, and sort of sub for Oscar Pettiford. So we also still though have Max Roach, we also have Sonny Rollins here. All right, so let's, let's talk just a little bit more about that title track, right? The one that was so difficult that it took 25 takes for the, uh, for the musicians to get it right. Um, it's easy to hear why, and that is because of the tempo changes. So those tempo changes are constant just throughout the entire piece. They're very abrupt, and it requires a lot of coordination and a lot of thought for a musician to be playing in sort of one tempo and then think in their head, okay, I'm about to shift, and we all have to shift together at the same time. Um, that's, it's, it's just a, a very difficult way to play, and that's the reason why, I think that's one of the reasons why this, uh, this particular track was so difficult to record. Um, one of, um, I guess, something that I'll say otherwise about this track is that um, there's a little bit of overblowing on some of the horns, and so I think uh, how people are gonna hear this track it's gonna be the first thing you're gonna to listen to when you hear it, is you're gonna think, man, this isn't exactly the prettiest thing I've ever heard. Um, and I think that there are moments of that and it's because the um, sort of dynamics of the horns are meant to change and there's like loud notes and soft notes and that kind of thing. And, um, and so, you know, it is just kind of how it was meant to be. Now, what I will say is that there are improvements that, um, that don't take away from that original intent, but make it a little bit easier to listen to. And I think that those improvements were, were made by Kraft with this, uh, with this reissue. Um, so otherwise, with the reissue, what you get is obviously a lower noise floor. So older pressings are gonna have a noise floor. I will say that my, um, my early reissue is in decent enough shape that there really isn't much of a noise floor either. I mean, it's like there's not really a mark on the record, so it's in really, really nice shape. And I think that actually makes this a, um, you know, probably a fairer comparison versus if I was talking about something that was say in like G plus shape, right? Um, but what I will say again is that um, this, this craft pressing is just so quiet, right? There's just no noise in the background and it's fantastic. Um, the clarity of the sound is very apparent on this track. Um, on Brilliant Corners. There is more separation between instruments uh, for sure um, across across this album and I think um, across this album and across this track. And I think that's important when so many musicians are sort of playing on top of one another. You don't want it to get sort of muddy and confusing um, about what's going on. And so when you have a little bit more separation, it helps add a little bit of sort of Again, clarity, I think, with the uh, with the recording, as opposed to this uh, the sort of density that would be created with all those instruments layered on top of one another, um, as it sounds in that uh, in that early reissue that I have. Uh, otherwise, I will also say that the instruments sound much more natural. What I mean by that is they sound how they're supposed to sound. Um, everything does, really. I, I think that the the, uh, the horns are, again, they're gonna sound okay regardless, and certainly the solos are just fantastic on this album. Uh, Clark Terry is on uh, that one track that he plays on is really good. Sonny Rollins sounds fantastic throughout. Ernie Henry has a little bit of um, sort of a raw touch with his, or a raw sound with his horn, it's just the way that he played. You can hear that on uh, on his own albums that uh, that he put out for Riverside as a leader. Um, but the um, sort of the, the more natural sound, I think, is most evident here with the piano, with the bass, and especially with the drums. Um, and, and it's interesting that I say bass because in some cases, you can't even hear the bass on the original pressing. 
uh, or the uh, the early pressing. Whereas um, I don't want to say that it's very prominent. I just think it sounds a lot more natural on the uh, on the craft reissue. So um, anyway, all of these kind of benefits I think come together quite well on what is probably the most difficult or challenging track, and that is that uh, that that uh, opener. All right, track two I'm going to cover kind of in brief, um, although it is probably my favorite track on the album, and it is called. Um, it's it's spelled phonetically, so it's Balu Bolivar Balu's R. You'd have to look at it for it to make a little bit more sense. Um, this is uh, this is one of my favorites on the album. I think it's probably because it's one of the more accessible tracks. There's a little bit more of a blues feel here. Um, I think that there's really nice sort of punctuation by Max Roach's like offbeat snare hits that kind of recall Monk's very percussive and kind of choppy style. And so I, I think that it's a, um, I don't know, there's like some clever moments like that, I think, that, uh, that add some interest. Um, I think that, um, let's see, Roach is, is almost exclusively on either Ride Symbol or and maybe Crash 2, and it sounds really nice. I think there's a lot of great detail on the Craft reissue. Um, and I just think this is a little bit more of a nuanced and delicate feel of piece versus say that brilliant corners that it just kind of hits you over the head a little bit or even Bemsha swing that kind of hits you over the head. This one's a little bit more nuanced and I think that's the reason probably why I enjoyed listening to it a little bit more. All right, so moving right along to Panonica, and this is that song that I mentioned that has the Celesta, and so that was gonna be something I was gonna look out for specifically, right? Um, and I will say that the craft reissue allows that Celesta to sound significantly better. Um, and I think that there's there's something about the crispness of the instrument that sounded dated in the um, in the early pressing, where it almost sounded it was like a music box that just wasn't recorded well. Here it sounds much more like a instrument. And I will also say that right up front, Monk is playing some left hand sort of low register notes along with the Celesta that I borderline didn't even hear. On the early re, uh, on the early reissue that I have, whereas this one it it sounds it's much more pronounced. You definitely hear those lower tones, and it works a lot better with the Celesta with that with those two uh, parts, those two hands paired paired together. Um, I will say that the Craft Edition sounds much warmer as well um, and more full, whereas the uh, the early reissue is like colder and like tinnier, um, and I think that. I, I even think that there's some improvements as well to how the saxophone sounds on this uh, on this track as well, um, where there's a little bit more of a roundness of the notes, a little bit more depth to uh, to how they sound. Um, so I I think that um, if if there's there's one other like probably glaring difference here between these two pressings and another area where the craft reissue wins, and that is Max Roach's. Um, sort of brushwork. So the brushwork, his accompaniment, sounds really harsh and almost even like sandpaper rather than natural brushes on that early reissue. Um, whereas it's just completely addressed. It doesn't sound like that at all. It's a lot more detailed. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to like, I don't even know if I'm describing it right, but like if you think about like the sound of like short, like sandpaper movements on wood, where it's like, you know, there's no sustain on it, right? All it is is this ch ch ch, like that kind of thing. That's how it sounds on the early reissue. It sounds much more natural on the craft reissue. All right, so um, I mentioned the two lineups. There's actually technically, I suppose, a third lineup, and that is Monk Solo. So he performs on his own on the piece I Surrender Deer. Um, and I think that this one, this piece, is fantastic. I will say that I'm the sort of person that doesn't exactly get a lot of enjoyment out of hearing Monk solo. So there's a couple of albums that he put out for Riverside and elsewhere that uh, that are just him solo. I just need I need something more than that typically. Uh, however, I Surrender Deer is just an absolutely gorgeous piece. He does a really good. This might be my favorite track that I've heard him do solo. Um, the funny thing is that I and I didn't hear this with the early reissue, but on the uh, the Craft reissue. I noticed that the piano is just slightly out of tune and there's like a few places where it's like more prominent and I'm not talking about him playing like, you know, um, sort of atonal chords. Like you can tell that the piano is just slightly out of tune. And I thought that that was um, really interesting, like, but very sort of like barely perceptible thing that, again, because the craft reissue is, 
is more detailed and has more clarity that you're actually able to pick out. Um, and, and I think otherwise on this uh, on this piece, the sustains are, are much more evident. And it's just really nice to hear sort of the starkness, I think, of Monk's Piano in this type of format, in the, um, in the format that, that Kraft is putting it out in. All right, so the last track, and I mentioned this earlier because of that timpani. So the title, or sorry, the, yeah, the title of this track is called Bemsha Swing. And um, this is probably going to be the most recognizable piece, actually, for folks who have listened to Monk because he previously recorded it. Um, so again, the biggest thing I was looking for is the timpani. And if you listen to this album, excuse me, if you listen to this track, earlier editions of this uh, particular piece, you're going to hear that timpani and you're going to think, what the hell is going on? Because it's almost like a sort of raucous playing of the timpani. Um, you, you wonder, is it playing in time with everything else? Like, why is it playing right now? Why isn't there drums? Um, it sort of like enters and leaves of its own volition. And it doesn't always make sense. And so I think because it is so sort of startling and so unusual to have that instrument, that voicing in a jazz context, it's, um, it, it just calls so much attention to itself. And so I was really interested because um, I was interested to hear what Kraft could do with it. Um, so this is what I would say, is that in the earlier pressing, there's definitely not as much separation between the timpani and the other instruments, which makes it sound even more jumbled and messier. Whereas the Kraft reissue has more separation between the instruments for sure, and the timpani just sounds better and more intentional. So as opposed to it being a little bit haphazard, I think because the attack because the attacks are crisper, feels more intentional. Don't get me wrong; it's still quite unusual to hear that instrument, and it still may rub some people the wrong way. Um, but but I I did think that they made improvements with uh, with the timpani uh, for sure on this on this piece. Otherwise, um, if there are differences, it's it's perhaps that Clark Clark Terry's horn is a little bit harsher on the uh, that early reissue. Um, and perhaps a little bit less appealing as a result, but that's only for that's only up front. And then when Clark Terry solos, and certainly when Rollins solos, like both of them, uh, their solos just sound fantastic, really good, regardless of which version um, that uh, that you hear uh, them in. And, and I think overall, there, there's probably also a little bit less fuzz around the horns, so especially in the lead out and the uh, sort of fade out of the not fade out but like at the tail end of the uh, of the track there's a little bit of fuzz around the horns and i don't know if that's because it's simply the center of the record right and so there's it's more likely to get a bit of uh, groove wear although my pressing isn't um you know it hasn't really been played but i, I think there there can be a tendency to have more distortion towards the center of the uh, the record definitely present on my early reissue not present on the uh, the craft reissue all right, so as always, I try to offer some closing comments, and usually at this point, you kind of know where my head's at anyway, because I've already talked through all the tracks. Um, so this is what I'll say about this, is that everything that I was hoping that uh, that Kraft would address in terms of you know the possibility for subtle improvements in the sound, I think was addressed. Um, I, I'll still say that um, this is a challenging record, and I think that, um, you know, I, I, I think that it's an incredibly um, influential record, and I think it's an amazing artistic statement, and I think it's a record that, at the same time that I set up front-focused listening is, is kind of what you should do. I also don't think you should overthink it, because you're not going to really get necessarily inside Monk's head. And, um, and and it's a little bit of an experience of an album to listen to, not unlike a lot of Charles Mingus stuff, where your best bet is to just kind of you know go along for the ride. Uh, and so I, I, th I think that that's how I'd characterize this album as well. Certainly, if you're looking for um, a great way to hear it, don't know if it's the best, but a great way to hear it, I think this Kraft uh, reissue really, really delivers. It sounds better than my early pressing. And I will <laughs> challenge anyone to find an original white label of, uh, of this from 1957 in in as good condition so that it sounds as best as it possibly can. Um, and it's possible the craft reissue will still sound better than that, right? So I, I think, um, you know, obviously this thing's expensive and um, I was still excited to get it. And, you know, I like music that's a little bit more challenging, stuff that I can listen to repeatedly and hear something different each, each time. Uh, and that is uh, that is definitely the case with this record. So I don't have any regrets getting it. 
And, um, you know, it's at least a, uh, if, if anybody was on the fence before about whether this was going to sound good, whether it was going to be sort of too audiophile or whatever that means, um, I don't think that's the case. I think that this is a, uh, I think this is a great representation of how, of, of, you know, possibly some of the best that it could sound. Again, I haven't heard the electric recordings, uh, electric recording company edition haven't heard analog productions, but from what I've heard, this is, uh, this is, you know, must be some of the best, um, sort of that, that you could, that you could possibly hear this album. So, um, yeah, I'm a fan and those are kind of my thoughts. So as usual, thanks for sticking with me and I'll see you next time.